By this time in the war, there were men from all over the world taking part. But you know what? They weren't just men from the warring nations. Thousands of men from nations that were not at war were fighting in Europe, including many thousands of Americans. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week saw the introduction of the new British weapon, the tank, as it rolled across the Germans at the Somme. The Irish also had some luck there, and on the Italian front and the Salonica front, the Allies began new offensives. Here's what came next. Well, the end of that offensive on the Italian front came this week. It was the seventh battle of the Isonzo River and had begun last week with heavy Italian casualties. The objectives of the battle were to break through on the Corso, but also to take Mount Rombon and the Bovec Basin. For the first few days of the week, the Italians attacked again and again, but they didn't make any significant gains. And when they did gain land, counterattacks drove them back before they could dig in. Thing is, in the attacks this week, Austrian casualties kept pace with Italian. And by the time Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna called off the battle the 17th, Austro-Hungarian General Svetozar Borovic von Bojna's army was pretty ragged. Italian production had created a big artillery gap between the two. Austrian food supplies were not up to snuff, and the Austrian draft was sending middle-aged men to the front lines after minimal training. But still, they defended well. In the assault on Mount Rombon the 16th, for example, this mountain is high in the Julian Alps, and the peak was held by two Bosnian battalions of the Austrian army. The initial artillery exchange resulted in small casualties for the Bosnians and early and fairly demoralizing ones for the Alpini, the Italian mountain troops. The assault that followed was a complete failure. Well, the whole battle was a complete failure, even though I have to point out that losses were only a few thousand more for the Italians than the outnumbered and outgunned defenders. But in this war, defense pretty much always had the advantage. Here's a couple of other things Cadorna did away from the battlefields. Colonel Duhet, chief of staff for the Carnia Corps, who would later shine under Mussolini, was very critical of Cadorna and was appalled by his ineffectiveness. He also corresponded with government ministers. In July, he gave one of them an assessment of Cadorna, saying his thinking was 45 years out of date. The idiotic concept of the frontal assault had killed the country's best soldiers. The insistence on holding every piece of conquered territory, regardless of losses, was ridiculous, and that Cadorna had no strategic vision. This was all pretty much true, but Duhait was not very discreet. Another missive in late August, arguing that the capture of Gorizia in the Sixth Battle of the Isonzo had not helped Italy's strategic position at all, found its way into Cadorna's hands. He had no doubt who the author was, and Duhet was arrested, court-martialed for breaching confidentiality, and jailed for a year. Also, the press and the public gave General Luigi Capello a lot of praise for the capture of Gorizia, so Cadorna banished him to a post on the Asiago Plateau. It wasn't just the Italians that were charging this week. Over at the Somme, it was the Canadians. The Battle of Flair Corselet was in full swing this week, coming to an end on the 22nd. Now, Britain had used tanks for the first time as the battle began last week. And though they mostly had mechanical problems, they and the creeping barrage had nearly collapsed the German defenses. And by the time the battle ended, after a week of fighting in rains that turned the whole area into a swamp, the British had advanced several kilometers and even taken some of the German third lines. In fact, they took about twice the amount of ground they'd taken on July 1st when the battle began for about half the casualties, just under 30,000 men. The Canadian Corps saw action at the Somme for the first time the 16th. There was actually a very famous charge that day by Private John Chapman Kerr. It's chronicled like this. Although his fingers had been blown off, he sprang from shelter and raced along the top of the trench, shooting down the enemy bombers from traverse to traverse. His astonishing onslaught proved the last straw for the badly shaken Germans, and 62 unwounded prisoners surrendered. Having delivered his captives at a support trench, Kerr returned to action without troubling to have his wound dressed. 
he won the Victoria Cross for his efforts. A side note, he was one of 14 volunteers from a single family. I'll talk about a couple of other individuals today for a change. On September 17th, 1916, a young pilot named Manfred von Richthofen won his first official aerial combat over Cambrai. He would soon gain fame as the Red Baron, the deadliest ace of the war. Now, he had already seen action dropping bombs on the Eastern Front, but dogfighting was new to him. Richthofen wrote in his diary soon after the event, my Englishman twisted and turned, flying in zigzags. I was animated by a single thought. The man in front of me must come down, whatever happens. At last, my opponent had apparently lost sight of me. In a fraction of a second, I was at his back with my excellent machine. I gave a short burst of shots with my machine gun. Suddenly, I nearly yelled with joy, for the propeller of the enemy machine had stopped turning. I had shot his engine to pieces. The enemy was compelled to land. The British plane was unable to reach Allied lines and touched down near a German squadron. Richthofen landed as well and ran over to the enemy plane. Not only was the engine damaged, but both pilot and observer were severely wounded. The observer died at once, the pilot a bit later. Richthofen placed a stone on the pilot's grave. Now, his star career was just getting going, but another star's career came to an end this week. A soldier named Dilwyn Starr died the 16th. He was American. He had volunteered in 1914 and driven ambulances for the French, then British armored cars at Gallipoli, and then transferred to a British Guards Regiment. There were 32,000 Americans who had gotten around British Army regulations and managed to serve. One of those regulations listed categories of people not allowed to enlist under any circumstances. Number six on the list was a foreigner. There was also development behind the lines on the Western Front this week. On the 16th, German Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg gave orders for a semi-permanent defense line built miles behind the front. This would become the Hindenburg Line and would be a fortified zone that could stop any Allied breakthrough of the front lines. But if you want to know what some of the Allies thought about the chance of that actually happening, here's a quote from French General Emile Fayol about the Somme. This battle has always been a battle without an objective. There is no question of breaking through. And if a battle is not for breaking through, what is its purpose? And over in Southeastern Europe, the Central Powers were trying for a breakthrough of their own. In Romania, where a Turkish and Bulgarian force was attacking under General August Mackensen, perhaps the best German field commander of the war. On the 17th in Dobrogia, Russo-Romanian forces had fallen back from Rasova to Tuzla and their situation seemed grave. But General Alexandru Avarescu had taken command there a day earlier with reinforcements and new Russian troops had arrived as well. And now they attacked Mackensen. The fighting was heavy, particularly at Rasova on the Danube. And if Mackensen had taken it, he could have flanked the Romanians and cut off communications between Dobrogia and the rest of Romania. But he didn't take it, and by the 19th was forced to retreat. And a couple of notes to end the week. On the 19th, the Belgians occupied Tabora, capital of German East Africa. And on the 22nd, Hejaz surrenders to the forces of the Arab Revolt. And the week ends with battles ending at Flier Corsolet and in Northern Italy. And the Germans pushed back in Romania, and the soon-to-be Red Baron's career takes off and Dilwyn Starr died. Just one more man, but one more American man. 32,000 Americans served in the British forces. That's a lot of men, and they were doing so totally illegally from British, American, even German perspective. You know, I've said before that while this war had lots of enemies, it didn't really have a bad guy. Neither the Central nor the Entente powers were the good guys. But obviously, a great many men 100 years ago did not agree with me, for they went to a war that was not their war and gave their lives for a cause that was noble to them. Think of them for a moment. If you'd like to learn more about the Red Baron, you can click right here to see our special bio episode about him. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Alistair Cooley. 
Yeah, that's another great name. I love that. Uh, don't forget to support us on Patreon for us to be able to keep making improvements to the show and to shoot on actual World War I battle locations. And also, do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And above all, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. See you next time.